Global Indian Network. Print, TV, events, podcast. Find out more at globalindianseries.com. You know, when you're writing something, you may write nonsense for the first three or four lines. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Just write. Just get it out. You know that thing, the morning pages. I used to do that a lot where you wake up first thing in the morning and you just write a page. It doesn't have to have any meaning. It doesn't have to be about anybody or anything. It could be the sky is not blue today. It's just that 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 exercise of just the process. Yeah. The process. The process. Not editing yourself, not necessarily having an outcome or 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 needing an outcome or an ending. It's just the process. Welcome to the Global Indian Podcast, the official platform for people of Indian origin. Yes, let's face it, we are everywhere. Welcome back to your weekly show where we plunge into the human experience of being a person of Indian origin, take a second look at the countries we now call home, and tackle the big conversations we need to have. In this week's episode, I am joined by the remarkable and wonderful Ashwin Sud. Now, Ashwin was born in Birmingham. Yes, I am a proud Brummie. I do not ever deny that fact. So to meet another Brummie is always an auspicious event for me. But more so, apart from just being a Brummie, Ashwin is a very well-renowned well and recognized musician. He is based in Canada and has done incredible work right the way across the globe. This is a podcast that really has a look at the rhythms of life. We take a real deep dive plunge into what's it like to be Ashwin, having a look at his music, looking at life lessons, as well as relationships. It really is an open conversation that I believe we can all learn something from. As always, I'd like to say a massive thank you to all our supporters and sponsors, many of which you hear from soon. And if you too would like to be part of the Global Indian Series, well, it couldn't be easier. Simply go to our website, which is www.globalindianseries.com to one, see the entire repertoire of the work that we do, and two, to get involved. You can share your story there. I truly hope you enjoy this session. Hi, my name is Divya and I'm co-founder of the Global Indian Podcast. Before you get to today's show, I've got a quick favour to ask. If you've been enjoying our conversations, I'd love if you could take just one minute to leave us a review on the platform that you're listening to us on and share our work to friends and family. It helps us out a lot. Word of mouth is the primary way that we grow. Thanks for your continued support. Hello. My name is Daniel Traça and I'm Dean of Nova School of Business and Economics in Carcavelos, Portugal, one of Europe's leading business schools. I'm proud to be of Indian origin and I invite you to discover this podcast, which will look to redefine the impact that Indians and their descendants are doing all over the world. In behalf of Nova School of Business and Economics, I wish you a great 2021. My name is Chitra Stern and I am a proud Global Indian Ambassador and CEO of Martignal Resorts and Martignal Residences. We pride ourselves on the journeys that define a community and our developments bring people together. Did you know that over 70,000 people just like us call Portugal home? The Global Indian Journey has brought people together in a meaningful way. And on behalf of all of us at Martignal, we want to thank you for joining us in these remarkable conversations. We look forward to seeing you here in Lisbon post COVID. Have a great day. And just move. So I, I suppose, let me kick it off. Um, I'm going to do this great introduction. I could go down the lines of, you know, a fellow Brummie on the other side of the world. I could do that, I know. I could go down the fact that you're this incredibly musician from Birmingham. I could go down that line. I could say that you're this remarkable Canadian who's achieved this stratosphere of success from Birmingham. You can see yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, But enough about Birmingham. What's <laughs> What's it like to be you? It's fantastic. I love being me. Uh, I'm lucky that at a very, very, very young age, I knew what I wanted to do. 
And I didn't know exactly how I was going to, going to get there. You know, I, I remember being, when my father took me to see Count Basie, which is the first concert he ever took me to. Um, and Count Basie had an all black band, but he had a fair skinned white drummer who played a white drum set and had blonde hair. So he stood out, his name was Butch Miles. He's a very uh, iconic jazz drummer. And he just stood out on stage as this vision. And I, at that moment, I was like, that's what I wanna do. That's what I wanna do. I wanna play drums, I want to make music. And that was from the age of seven. So it's the only thing I've wanted to do. And of course it has taken a lot of skill and studying the instrument and, and talent, but there's luck also that because it, it, uh, just the way that everything fell into place for me, I finished high school, I went to music school, returned to Canada to start my career and started working and haven't stopped. Yeah. And, and, the, and the trajectory has been pretty, I, I mean, I, I feel very lucky, but I, I know it's been a lot of hard work also, but there was a passion and a drive there from the age of seven, from as long as I can remember. It's the only thing I know how to do, and it's the only thing I've wanted to do. So I'm, I love being me. I, I love this journey that I'm on that is up and down and has had tragedy and has had joy and has had all the above and everything in the middle. The thing is because you are known in Canada for a variety of different reasons. Sure, yes. And music has been that powerful expression. I think it's, it's, it's probably the first language on this planet, whether it's a hum or drum beat, it's defined who we are. The drums beating in the, the drums beating in the forest, you know, yeah, everybody comes. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So then what, what's that form of expression for you? What has it taught you about being human through the power of music? Boy, you know, I mean, for, for me, music is like air. It, it, it's the thing I can't live without. It's, it's, the, it's like water. It's like food. Uh, it, it, it's like air. It's the thing that I breathe. Uh, it's what it's, it's not, it doesn't define me completely, but it's a huge, huge part of who I am uh, and my journey and the things I like to do and the people I like to surround myself with the music. I love to live my daughters. I have two, we have two daughters. They love music. We play music in the house all the time. They are in charge of the music now, you know, the way that they've, amass the technology of you know spotify and apple music they run the music in the house and it's fantastic i love it so much um sorry and your question was what's it like to, to remind me what your i probably went completely off board there. <laughs> yeah, is this what's that what does it mean for you what does music represent to you in your life because look i, I suppose if we deal with the elephant in the room you know let's yeah go from there yes you know, you're a famous musician in your own right you create this, your whole expression, your whole life has been about music, your marriage through to obviously your relationships is all musically entwined. It's, I've never met anybody in this world of 50 shades of brown that has ever been entwined towards one particular thing. Yes, for, for a long time, for 20 years, 20 plus years. Um, I'm so proud of it. I'm so proud to have to have been, and I'm still involved because I still do uh, make music with Sarah. Um, I'm very, very, uh, I'm so, uh, there's such a history there and it goes so deep and we are intertwined and our fiber is so with, you know, we are intertwined. It's so, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine last week and he was asking me, he was doing a, a drummer type podcast and he was asking me, I don't even know what to ask you because I don't know anyone who has been in a situation like yours. And I said, yeah, I, I don't know what to tell you. It just, it was what it was. We, I, I was in her band for seven years. Then we fell in love. Then we got married. Then we made music for another 12 years. Um, music was always unspoken between us. We didn't have to talk about it. We just made it. There was no, uh, uh, our roles were very defined. And I was, uh, I, I loved my role as her band member. And I never abused that privilege. And, and then when we fell in love, it, it was very much, I didn't want, I, I didn't want people to think that I was somehow taking advantage of my position uh, of being married, that it was somehow, oh, well, of course he's going to play drums with her forever. 
I always took my role very seriously and, the, and, and making, making the art very, very serious. Um, and, and, and I've been very fortunate to make art with somebody whose music is just, you know, it makes you feel something. Sarah has that power and, and to be involved in the capacity of a drummer, percussionist, to make music that really makes people feel something, that is the greatest feeling of all. Because that's what we all want, isn't it? We all want to feel something in this human form. And it's that authenticity. And, and the thing is, what music has the ability to do is cross cut. No matter yes. what language, no matter what type of tonality you're feeling at that moment in time, it is that hidden alchemy. That yes, and, 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 and music, and, you know, and music and songs have that power to take you back to a moment in time. Yeah. Where, where you remember where you were, where you heard that song and how it made you feel. And I love that part about music where you, a song will come in the radio and it's like, oh my God, I haven't heard this for 15 years, but I remember when I first heard it, what, how it made me feel. And I love that about music, love it so much. And I still, to this day, when I listen to, to music that I haven't listened to a long time, I'm reminded it's like, oh my goodness, this was so long ago, but it still has that same effect on me. Why has it got this powerful motive on you? What is it? You said, obviously, from the age of seven. You know, so if we go down the whole Sigmund Freud route, you know, show me a seven-year-old, I'll show you an adult. Yeah, sure. But for you, what is it about that? What, what was that, that power, that mode of expression that you latched onto so strongly? I mean, my father played music in the house growing up. He played the Beatles. He played Harry Belafonte. He played jazz music. He played Indian music, not that much Indian music, but more sort of, you know, the British wave of the Beatles and then uh, the music from the West Indies because he practiced medicine there for a bit. So it was always playing in the house and I was always singing and I was always tapping on things. It's always been in there for me. So, you know, for me at that young age going, I'm going to be a musician, not even really knowing what that meant. Yeah. It's, it's all I've ever known. It, it, I know how it makes me feel when I get on the drums and I play and I'm working on and I'm practicing and I'm learning something. I love the challenge of it. I love getting uh, the breakthrough when you get to the other side and you're like, oh, I finally figured it out. Or when we're working here in the studio on a song and we're laboring and laboring and you have that breakthrough and it's like, ah, oh, it's you know, the clouds open up above you and you have that epiphany of like, this is it. This We found it. You know, it's that, it's that journey. It's that, it, it's that, it, it, you know, it's that push. It's that pull. It's those days where you're not creative for three days and you're like, God, nothing is happening. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, you tap into something. It's like, oh yeah, this, there it is. Yeah. And I love that journey, that challenge that it, it's, it's a struggle. You know, it is a bit of a struggle. Uh, and I love that this is because the end, the end, the end game is so rewarding, you know, and it, it's not about success or fame or sales or wealth it's more that when you create and you hear it and you're in the studio and sometimes i'm here by myself and i'll have those moments of like Ta-da! there's nobody here to share it with but it's just <laughs> but it's just great that you that you make those breakthroughs and because of you know it's such a funny time we're in night right now where we can't actually be in the room working with other musicians but we're able to send files back and forth across town uh, uh, from, uh, to another city to another country it's, it's pretty interesting when you get files back sent to you and you import them into your music and you play it back. And it's like, this sounds fat. You know, this is great. This is exactly what I wanted. So it's, it, it's, it's technology has allowed us to be able to be able to work like this. Thank goodness. Because, you know, historically the connection of music and three or four people in a room together, playing together, there is an energy that happens mm -hmm. that it, it's, you can't explain. And, 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 you know, not being able to play music in front of people, in front of an audience, you know, people are really, we need that. We need that so badly. Do you believe in fate? I believe, I believe in a journey and I believe that things happen for a reason and we are in charge of that journey and we make mistakes. Fate I, I, I wouldn't say I don't believe in it, but I'm sort of more, I, I, I believe that we're all on this journey and we have actually have no idea where we're going. We, we, we take a left, we take a right, we make some good decisions, we make some bad decisions. 
and, and things play out and they land in your lap. And in that moment, you have to deal with them. It may have been not been the right thing, the wrong thing, but there it is. Um, we want to evolve. I don't want to make the same mistakes, but I know I'm going to make new ones. And, and I allow myself that. Historically, I, listen, I beat, up my, I, I beat up myself a lot when my marriage fell apart. I took on a life, I felt a lot of guilt. And I felt like a statistic. And I very much was like, oh my God, not me, not us now. I thought we were better than this. So while I never ever thought that that would happen, it happened. I never want it to happen again. I will do everything in my power to make sure whatever chapter two is, if there's uh, somebody else that I, I won't make the same mistakes, of course I will make new ones. But what do you think was the reason for that closeness to him disappear? So many people have always asked me that. And, and, and the simplest answer I can give is that two people forgot to take care of each other. And I would never point a finger at, at, at this one thing being the fault of it. Life got in the way. Music got in the way. Our, it, it, it was a, a very fast trajectory into a different world of success. Then we had children. Along that entire journey, somewhere, we forgot to take care of each other. And when you do, and, I, and, I, and I sort of look at a relationship is that, you know, it's this house at the top. It's these two people in a relationship. Beneath them is their children, the family, the work, everything else. If that house is not taken care of, everything else will fall apart. And that's the mistake that I made. That, that I, I absolutely take su such responsibility for, you know, not taking care of my partner. Unconsciously, not even knowing you're not doing it. Everything else is so busy in the way you just forget. And I think it's a bit of a cliche, but I think so many relationships fall apart when that, you know, that, that, that one thing, you know, at the beginning, it was just the two of you. It was nobody else. There was nothing else. There was, there was not the busyness. It was just the two of you. And something tapped you in to bring you together. Now with Sarah and I, it was certainly music that brought us together. Um, and it was always unspoken when we made music together. We just did it. It was so unconscious and, and effortless. Uh, and we were very lucky, very lucky to sort of find that uh, in each other. I would say that that's what happened to us. We just forgot to take care of each other. You've got this incredible relationship now. And I, I know there's another guest that we had on the podcast and we we're speaking about that. It's the fact that in society, we have this perception that divorce means you never speak to that other partner again. Everything is separate from now on until time memorial. Yes. But somehow, is it the music that's kind of kept things moving? Is it the fact that you got this mutual still, that there's a feeling there? That there's, What is it that has allowed you to actually have this great friendship with your ex-wife? And obviously, you, you, you're together. You're, you're still producing things. It's taken time. Um you know, we have two children, we have two daughters, so we are forever connected. The music thing there for, for two or three years, um, she didn't call me to make any music with her. I didn't think she ever would again. And then the first time she did after a number of years, it was literally, she was here working with another producer um, and I was actually just down the street uh, at a coffee shop and and she called me on the phone. She said, well, what are you doing right now? And I said, I'm next, just down the street getting a coffee. She goes, do you want to play, come and play drums in the studio? I'm like, yes. <laughs> and that's pretty much all we said. I came to the studio. I started working. And it was literally picking up where you left off. Do you know, I have to ask, what does music mean to you? Because it seems like it's your very fabric of your existence is up there with oxygen. Because the way that you speak but about it is. music, it's, it's almost 
it's yeah i mean I've, I've always said it's the only thing i know how to do and i'm okay with it being the only thing i know how to do um i've done it for such a long time i know how it makes me feel i know what happens when i don't do it for three or four days i get a little bit squirrely um it is like oxygen it is like food that's it's such it's such a part of the daily routine for me. Waking up, making a coffee, having breakfast, going to the studio, doing some work. Some days you're creative, some days you're not, but you've put the effort in to, to try and be creative. It, it's, you know, and sometimes when, when I take a break from it, if, if there's a, a week or two where you go away, I can feel myself it's like, I, I need to go see some live music somewhere. We need to go see some music. Let's go find, let's go. And you can't see that anywhere now. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know and, and I'm not, I'm not a guitar player. So it's not like I can throw a guitar on my back and always have that, a bit, you know, for me, it, it's the drums, it's the studio, it's the keyboards, it's composing. Um, I, I, I love it. I, I've, I've done it forever. I don't see myself retiring from it. I don't need to retire from it. You it's, know? it's a language, isn't it? That's the thing. It's it's a language for you. It goes on forever. That is remarkable. Honestly, actually, I, I am stuck for words. And that's a rarity in my life. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's, um, no, but I, I totally get it. It's it's a vibe. It's, it's who you are. It's your expression to the world to say, Yes. This is my life. This is who I am. And rather than using words, people use words, people use actions. You use a tonality of bringing to life. Absolutely. Like an alchemist, you know, you bring it together different sounds to make yes. sense of it all. Yeah. And, and it was interesting when we, when we, one of the things I've always admired about Sarah is she has this ability. She works very hard when she's making music and when she doesn't, when she wants to step away from it, she can step away from it for a big chunk of time. That was always difficult for me. It was difficult for me to stop. And, you know, the transition to having our first daughter was challenging. You know, you, you go to the hospital as two and you come home as three and everything has now changed forever. Absolutely. And that just dis not distraction, but that you know, mute, when our first daughter was born for that first year, there was really no making any music. You know, we were, we were in the thick of it with our daughter and, and, and that, and that relationship, you know, between a daughter and the mother, you know, the relationship between a, a baby and a mother yeah, is something that the men cannot understand. You know, for me, that first year, I was very lost. I didn't know how to fit in. You know, other than you can take the baby, you can change a diaper. You can't really stop this alien from crying. You just can't. And that beats you up. That beat me up. So I felt a bit that first year with our first daughter, India, it was very much like, I don't understand where I fit into this equation. And uh, it's almost like, I wish somebody would have given me the manual of that first year, you're the man here, read this. This is yeah. what it's going to be like. And our first daughter, India, she didn't sleep for a year. <laughs> Which means nobody in the house sleeps for a year. Absolutely. And everybody is a prick to each other. Yeah. And that, you know, that sleep deprivation, oh my goodness, takes its toll on everybody in the house. So that first year, you know, Sarah has this wonderful ability to shut off music when she doesn't uh, when, when she's her distraction is elsewhere her interest is elsewhere I don't have that ability I need to keep making it I need to be continue to evolve in it and I think that was a little bit of an issue for us also where she didn't understand that we've done so much together let's take a break haven't what we've what we've done isn't that enough for you and, and it's and it wasn't that it wasn't enough it was just it's such a part of my everyday the, existence was, yeah existence that it was difficult to you know take a break from it and i struggled with that uh with our second daughter you know it, it, it was it was a lot easier that that first year but there was still that there was still that 
I needed to keep making music. I needed to be, continue to be creative. You know, we, had, we were on the road touring the world for over 20 years. And then it came to a bit of a stop. That was an adjustment. That was a complete adjustment. More so for me than for her. Uh, you know, you, you've, you've, you've done this cycle for 20 years. You make a record, you go and promote it. You take a little bit of time off, but you get right back into it. And then it was, we were at that different place in our lives where, oh, we're going to start to start a family. We're like, yeah, but we got to keep making music. We got to keep making records. <laughs> Didn't have to. Uh, I wanted to, and I think I had that struggle with, with slowing down or, or maybe changing the responsibility. You know, and well, when you have children, your responsibilities do change. They have to change. Yeah. They ha and I'm good with that now. I I'm happy that, um, you know, because we split when our second child was only one, there was a conscious effort for me to not work for a number of years, to be home, to be in the trenches, uh, you know, being the father to my kids. And, and I don't regret that one bit. Um, and I think that's what brought... Sarah, our, our closeness back to each other also. We live seven minutes apart from each other. My phone can ring at any time and she can call and I'll be there in a second. I will have her back like nobody will ever have her back. And I like that. And that's why we are, we are good with each other. And it's great. Um, we weren't for a few years, but it has taken some time. It's because you've made the conscious effort to try Absolutely. That. Um, and it, it was very conscious that whatever happened between her and I had nothing to do with children. It had nothing, it had nothing, it only had to do with her and I. So, you know, these parents that put their children in the middle of it, and I see a lot of it, I see it all the time. Mm -hmm. It's horrific. To me. Our kids are loved and they feel the love from their parents. They bounce back and forth. They see us together and they roll our eyes. If I go up to the house right now and, and walk into the kitchen, I'll give Sarah a kiss and a hug and it's all good. And we tell each other we love each other because we do. We're well, lucky. I was going to say, has the separation re-changed the way that you look at relationships? Has it almost brought in a closeness to what it is to be human? Because surely we can't just be defined by social expectations of how no. one's supposed to have a relationship. No, and, and, I, and I think when you, start, when you start thinking about a chapter two or meeting somebody else, you know, it, it's going to look different. I have children with this woman. Uh, I was, I've been connected to her for so long. I sometimes don't feel I have the bandwidth to do it again, to start over and really give a relationship all the attention that it deserves. I wonder if people should live together in the same home. What do you mean? You know, I've lived on my own now for 10 years. I've gotten quite used to it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in my 50s. I'm stuck in my ways. I don't know if I have the give and take that is required now at this point in my life to do it again. And I have have a girlfriend right now and it's it's it it it's very different the things i'm thinking about versus when i first fell in love and i think about gosh could i live with somebody again could they live with me i'm so stuck in my ways am i willing to give i understand the give and take of relationships i don't know if i have the ability to do the give and take anymore i really don't sometimes what are you searching for? Oh boy, that's a loaded question. You know, I, I, I grew up with a, a, a very, very loving, generous, caring, alcoholic of a father. The, mo the kindest, most gentle alcoholic I've ever. He was such a lovely man, but for his entire life, my mother died when I was 18 months old, my father's wife. He never got over it. His marriage out of, his, uh, out of everybody in the families was not arranged. It was a marriage out of love. And he never got over 
the death of my mother, even though he remarried four more times, he never got over the death of her. I understand that headspace. And so I think about my own relationship, you know, in terms of what am I searching for? I understand what he was searching for. I understand why he was so sad his entire life. I'm not sad. Uh, I, I'm, I'm quite happy, but I'm very reflective all the time. And it's not regret. It's more reflecting on, you know, uh, what has happened and, and what is it supposed to look like going forward? It, my mind changes every day. My thought process changes every day on, on what it's uh, supposed to look like, what it is I'm searching for. I'm, I'm, I want to continue to be creative. I love being around people. I love being in the company of a woman. I don't know how long I can do it for because then I crave the company of myself. That doesn't work for everybody. So what I'm searching for changes. It seems to change all the time. And I'm okay with that. Let's say, for example, with this mysticism, I think that's the best way to put it, of music, of bringing together the divine chords, so to speak. Mm -hmm. What are you searching for there? Because you've got this mindset that is so fixed within that medium. It's yes. If we were to remove the word music to some type of godliness of nature, people call you a saint. This is a yeah. guy that has forsaken the whole world for his uh. pursuits of that. But this thing obviously plays a massive role in your life. I just imagine, and maybe I'm just thinking out loud, but are you searching for something through that? Does it define a sense of meaning, define a sense of purpose? What is well, I think that, provides? yeah, with, with creating music, there's always, there's always, um, you know, when you finish a song or finish a project, there's a little win you feel. There, there's, there's that uh, very sense, satisfying sense of you've completed something. And then it's literally, okay, on to the next thing now. So there's, there's, there's always those, those small little joys that happen with finishing a record, finishing a project, and you're already excited about the next one. That never changes. That cycle uh, completes. You know, I've gotten qu quite a bit more picky and stubborn these days about what music I choose and who I choose to make it with. You know, I want to be surrounded by people who I enjoy making music with. But first and foremost, I have to love the music. I have to love the project. It can't just be about, oh, we're going to pay you this much. It's like, if, if it doesn't resonate with me, I'm the first to say, I can find someone who's better than me for this for you. Because this is not, uh, I'm not the right person for this. I'm the it's, first. This is your identity, this, isn't it? This is complete, about you. And completely. And it has to make me feel something. And it has to make me feel something right away. Yeah. From the moment somebody comes here uh, with an idea for a song, I have to feel it. Yeah. It's the only way we're going to get the beauty out of yep. that performance, yep. out of that song. I can't just go into autopilot and go, yep, let's do this. Can't do it. Did it early in my career because you have to, or when you're early in your career, you, you have to say yes to everything because it, you, you're, you're, you still don't know who you are as a musician. So you're saying yes to everything. You're working on everything. And then at some point you get to a point where I think I know what kind of musician I am now. Absolutely. Because you've been through the whole repertoire. So you realize, ah, through, okay. yeah, you, that, yeah, and that takes true. time. You know, that takes 30, 40, some 30 years, 20, 20 years of making music to get to a place where you're like, now I know what kind of music I really want to make. And I was very lucky to start to work with Sarah for as long because I got spoiled. When you're working with an artist of that level of greatness as a singer, as a songwriter, as a performer, and you're part of it, it sets the bar very high. And you become very picky and choosy about who you want to work with because you know how good it can be. And so I've always held the music that I make, you know, outside of Sarah, very high, especially with female singers, because I know how great it can be. So in some ways, I'm a bit ruined. I'm a bit, I'm a but bit like... I think, I think there's a deeper part to that. It's the fact that you need to feel an authentic connection. Completely. What's been done. Be. And so therefore, the skill level is one thing, but it's saying it's a strive for authenticity. Yeah, but skill has nothing to do with it. You know, it's more that mm. feeling you get from 
that person's music, how they sing, how they play their instrument, what they're writing about. Yeah. Skills, any, anybody can learn the skill. You know, you need to master the skill to let the talent out. Yeah. Right? It's, yeah. I, do you know what? It's, it's really weird because we're both from two different worlds almost in a sense, but I totally get the language. I totally yeah. get everything that you mean. It's. Do you play any kind of instrument yourself? I do. <laughs> I do. You do great. <laughs> yeah, I, I get it. So um, I play dubla, but Asian underground. Oh, music beautiful. Like, so along those I don't lines, play. I don't I write, play. I write poetry, you know, and for me, poetry is the same thing as. Absolutely. As, is my connection to the world. It's, it's understanding everything here. Yes. So I get it. Ashwin, I totally. From a young age, I knew. And like you, I was very fortunate. I knew exactly what I wanted. And yes. somehow it started to mold itself in. And you put, and it's hard work as well, right? So we of can't take course. it. We, we put course. ourselves there. But then you realize, even in its toughest moments, when you think, man, this is life or death, you would not want to be anywhere else because it's who we are. It's, it's, it's who it's we are. Every echelon of your being is. Absolutely. No, I Absolutely. It. You know, they say, what, what is it? 90% of our body is water. Well, yeah. 90% of my body is music. Yeah, but I get it because it's a rhythm of life. And not to be cliche it about it, it's saying. It is. It is. There's something in our soul that pulses that you feel it. And you Absolutely. need that rhythm. A bit like how a shark can't stop. It has to keep swimming. It Absolutely. The same yeah, way. I mean, it, it's sort of. Uh, uh, here, here in West Vancouver, there is a, uh, there's a, a long walk along the ocean. It's called the seawall. Yeah. And I try and go do it at least two or three times a week. And I watch people walk and I watch people because people have a cadence when they walk yeah. and they have a rhythm when they walk. And mm -hmm. I know when I'm listening to music, I have a cadence and a rhythm yeah. when I walk. And I love watching that about people. You, you know, it, it's quite, it's quite interesting to see. Yeah, we do have a rhythm with the way, you know, we breathe, we walk, we absolutely the way that yeah. the trees sway. Everything's absolutely. got a rhythm. Everything. And, and if, if you want to deeply listen into that, I think it reveals more about yourself and about the world. Maybe I'm getting poetic. I don't know. But yeah. I think it reveals so much more about the world in which we live when we just literally stop, listen, observe and digest. Absolutely. And not get in the way of it and let it flow. And let it come out. Yeah. And that is the key is to tap into that flow and not get in the way with it. You know, don't edit yourself. Uh, you know, when you're writing something, you may write nonsense for the first three or four lines. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Just write, just get it out. You know, that thing, the morning pages, I used to do that a lot where you wake up first thing in the morning and you just write a page. It doesn't have to have any meaning. It doesn't have to be about anybody or anything. It could be the sky is not blue today. It's just that, that, that exercise of just the process, yeah. the process, the process, not editing yourself, not necessarily having an outcome or, or, or needing an outcome or an ending. It's just the process. And that's sometimes, uh, that's a lot of the times here working in the studio when you're just, you're, you're creating, you're not, you don't really know what you're, there's no, you're not working with somebody you're working on your own, you're creating, you're composing music. You'll work for three or four hours and just be like, there's nothing here. And then you come back the next day, fire up what you were working on the night before. And it's like, oh my goodness, I didn't even hear this yesterday. So you don't edit yourself. And, you, and, and the great thing about having a studio is you can always record. Yeah. You can always record and you can go back and then find maybe little moments that, that spark into something else. Uh, and I, and I love that sort of th that freedom of not editing yourself and not necessarily worrying about, is this good or is this bad? Just let it be what it is. Let it flush out, let it come out, let it come out. And you'll have your days where you, nothing comes. But is that because of the experiences that you've been through? It's also shaped your mindset to realize, actually, I don't need to get in my way. I can just let the process be. Um, yeah. Let the pro, I mean, the process will always, um, it is a process. <laughs> it just is a process and you cannot fight it. And you cannot, you, you cannot come to the studio and say, I am going to write a hit today. You, you just, mm. you can't come with that attitude. It's just, I'm going to come here. I'm going to work. I'm going to compose. Let's see what today brings. 
What a remarkable conversation. It's so trippy as well in all the best possible ways. I really do hope you took massive amounts of confidence from this. I think if you are a person entering the world of music or you are something that's looking for lessons from life, it is such a beautiful podcast because there's so much into this tapestry that is Ashwin's life. And I think it is a remarkable voyage in itself just to be open enough to have these discussions. Well, I really enjoyed having you here. And next week, I enjoy having you back where we plunge once more into the human experience of being a person of Indian origin. Now, if you would like to support us, there's a really simple, easy way to do that. All you simply need to do is, if you like this, considering like, sharing, and commenting. Because with your help, it helps us with those digital algorithms. Yes, the world is artificial intelligence in more ways than one. So um, it does really help out if you can kind of push the content out there. Until next week, I hope all remains well and safe. Thank you for joining us on this journey.